Hello and welcome to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. This podcast is all about our journey into the woods of ourselves, getting to know who we are, where we are, and where we're going in life so that we can create the life that we want to live. It's about deepening your connection with yourself, taking inspired action, and really trusting yourself and your intuition. It's also about mindset. Our beliefs are such an important part of this journey, and there are so many ways for us to change our mindset so that we can more easily live a life of expansive joy. This podcast is also about going literally into the woods and spending time in nature, and how that can help us on our own personal journey of self-knowledge. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now let's get into this week's episode. Hello, adventurers, and welcome to the Into the Woods podcast, episode 421. This is your host, Holly Wharton, and I'm back with another fantastic guest. Today, we've got Cara Wilde back on the show, and she hasn't been here in a while. When we first started the episode, for some reason, I thought she had been on the show just as recently back as in June. But then I checked, and it's been a lot longer. It was actually back in March, so it's been a while. Today, we are talking about adventures with stone circles. And I'm really, really excited to have Kara on the show talking about this because she lives in Cornwall, where she's got several stone circles within walking distance or running distance from her home. Now, if you've listened to this podcast for a while, or if you've read my book, If Trees Could Talk, you'll know how important the Avebury Stone Circle is to me. But I don't really understand what goes on when I visit Avebury. I just feel like it's a very special place to me, and I always feel like something's going on that I don't necessarily understand, but it's more than just, I really like this place. So this was a great conversation to have with Kara. We talk about how she works with stone circles and what might be possible. So stone circles are a fascinating part of our history, and I think they're very much worth visiting, even if you don't consider yourself to be a spiritual person. So who's Kara Wilde? If you haven't heard of her before, you haven't heard her on the show, Kara is a mystic shaman and healer whose business, Wild Bliss, focuses on creating a more sacred planet one person at a time. Kara supports professional women who want to remember who they truly are, why they are here, and want to express that as a body of work in the world. Kara left her counseling and more mainstream work behind her when she couldn't use her psychic abilities or work with guides, and began to feel as though she was working blind. She set up her own business as an EFT practitioner, started to use her channeling and intuitive abilities, and felt like she'd got the team on board and helped her clients in making more significant and longer-lasting changes in their lives. Part of her work, Kara channels a collective called The Ancients and offers practical guidance and support that is specific to the needs and concerns of those of us who are deeply sensitive and passionate about creating real change in the world. Kara passionately believes that those of us considered misfits are truly here to create a new way in the world and are part of the divine's blueprint for a heaven on earth. Kara lives in Cornwall, surrounded by the ocean and stone circles. When she isn't working, you can find her running the trails or curled up under a heavy blanket with a good book. You can find her at her website, carawild.com, and that's wild with an E, and at Instagram at wildcara. And again, that's wild, W-I-L-D-E, cara, C-A-R-A. So what are you going to learn in this episode? What do we talk about? We talk about what are stone circles and where they can be found, why you might want to visit a stone circle, how to engage with stone circles, what stone circles want from us, how to build a relationship with a stone circle, Things you can do when you visit a stone circle. We ask the question, is bigger better for stone circles? Finally, we talk about where to go to learn more about stone circles and other ancient sites. So let's get into the episode. Hope you enjoy it. Hi, Cara. Hi, Holly. How are you doing? Good. I'm excited to have you back on the show. It's been a while. How long has it been? I have no idea. Uh, I bet you don't know now I've asked you that. Well, that's a good question. I do have my spreadsheet here, but Um, it has been... um, my hero when it uh, uses- oh my god it's been not that long i don't know it's been a while since june yeah anyway <laughs> it hasn't been that long <laughs> well thank you for having me back oh i'm glad to have it back because this is something that i've been wanting to talk about in the show for a while and i am definitely not an expert in this you have much deeper relationships i think with stone circles than i do so here we are so <laughs> Today we're talking about adventures with stone circles. So I want to start out by asking you, what are stone circles? When I think of that, I just, 
obviously they're a collection of stones. Mm -hmm. Quite often there is 19 in a stone circle related to a year with the moon (gasps) cycles. Oh. Uh, And that's something that I've just found out very recently. So they're a collection of like standing stones in Mm. a circle. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, I know. It It kind of defines itself, doesn't it? (laughs) Yeah. There's also some that are considered um, stone circles that aren't quite like that. So where I live in Cornwall in West Penwith, we've got four and three of them are traditionally what you would think of as standing uh, stone circles. But the other one is Menantol. So that is two standing stones with one circular stone in the middle Ooh. and that's considered a stone circle too okay so for me they are i think when i think about stone circles they're meeting places so mm. i mean yeah so meeting places for ancient people or for now or for whom well for all of it like yeah so i mean to re- to go into more of what I think they were originally intended for I mean nobody really knows and I've read quite a lot of not quite a lot but I've read some information but the idea with standing stones is that they are just focal points meeting places a place for ritual a place for gatherings so I think you know a bit more of the history than I do when they were built but they're quite often associated with the Bronze Age and they were probably where people went to do burial rites and so mm. they're just like the church. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. They, you know, that's how I treat them. They're like my church, really. Yeah. yeah, I absolutely agree. And I actually did some a little bit of research on stone circles because I didn't know, you know, I had some questions that I wanted us to talk about, but I didn't know the answers to them. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so where can they be found? I knew they were found, obviously, here in Britain, across Northern Europe. I knew that as well, because there's this guy I follow on Instagram that takes these gorgeous pictures of stone circles and ancient stone sites in Northern Europe. But I didn't know that they were found throughout the Horn of Africa, which is Ethiopia, Somalia, Eritrea, and Djibouti. So I found that to be really interesting, because people were creating these types of probably sacred places in many different parts of the world. I mean, I would be curious to see if people were doing this in Asia as well. Mm, I think it's part of like a spiritual heritage, really. Mm, Absolutely. So as you said, they were built in the early Bronze Age, also in the late Neolithic era, which is what I thought. I didn't realize they extended into the Bronze Age so much, but most of them apparently were built from 3000 BC. So these are really, really ancient sites. And a lot of them were built throughout a long period of time. So Stonehenge, it's estimated that it was done between 3000 BC and 2000 BC. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine the amount of work that goes into these things. So I think a lot of them would have been done throughout generations, like Avebury. So for me, that means, must mean that the original ideas and what they were used for were passed down through, you yeah. know, through story mm. and, yeah. Yeah, and um, culture and tradition and yeah. probably multiple generations of people going to these places for whatever ceremonial use they were used for. And perhaps different generations of people had different ideas of how to kind of add upon the site and, mm. yeah. Oh, I wish we could time travel. <laughs> I know, me too. Oh my God, I would love to go to Avebury when it was intact before the damn Victorians pulled down some of the stones. Mm. Oh, so Avebury, which is, we've been there together. And as people listening to this know, it's my favorite place <laughs> in the world, probably. That was completed as a kind of a set of various projects between 3000 BC and 2400 BC. So that was built over about 600 years. And there's several different sites in the Avebury area. It's not just those stone circles. We've got West Kennet Longborough. We've got that other stone circle, which one stone only remains. West Kennet Avenue, which again, half torn down. But there are so many, so many different sites in that area. You can tell just by going there that it was an area full of community and people and really hardworking people. Yeah, you can feel it, can't Mm. you? You can just feel it everywhere there. Mm. Mm. So, as you said, we can only guess as to why they were built. Probably ceremony, meeting places, gathering places, who knows. Mm. So, what's your experience with stone circles? Because for me, the only site that I kind of keep going back to is Avebury. 
it's my place. Like I go there all the time, not、mm. as much as I used to. But you have a very different way of engaging with stone circles and working with them, which is not something that I do. So I would love to hear what's your experience and and how do you engage with them? Well, I engage with them really personally, and that's because when I first moved to Cornwall about eleven years ago, I put out a call to Source Energy to connect me with a new soul family of friends. And then synchronicity led to me having a friendship with a group of like the sea witch, what does she used to call us that, hedge witch, druids, pagans, and they opened me up to like earth spirituality, earth based、mm-hmm. spirituality, which was really new to me because I was always like in the angelic realm before then. So if anybody feels like they're a bit nervous about nature, and then they listen to a podcast like this. And think, oh, I can't do that.、Mm. I just want to reassure you that you can, because when I first moved down here, I was out on the moors looking for the tarmac and the signpost because <laughs> I'm a townie, and I was terrified. I used to leave the car door open in case I got chased by a bull. <laughs> 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 so I was not like a natural at this,、mm. but led me to working with Stannan, which is one of my favourite stone circles on Bodmin Moor,、mm. and so they. I thought it was just like a pleasant way to spend an afternoon, but when I watched somebody open the circle, I saw a blue flame from their wand, and thought, "Oh, okay, maybe it's more than a pleasant way to spend <laughs> spend your days." And his wand was like a piece of tree branch, you know, it wasn't、mm. like a little tiny Harry Potter wand. So that group of people really introduced me to a way of working with the stone circles and. It was very much I was taught like that how to cast a circle, how to open a circle, cast a circle, and how to work with it in that from that traditional place of witchcraft.、Mm. But they all had their own relationship with earth energies and their own way of working, and so I quickly developed an intuitive way of working. And can I talk to tell you about when I was working with Lilith? I don't know if I told you about this before.、Mm, no, please. So I was living on the edge of Bodmin Moor, so we had like sheep for、um, neighbours, and we just lived in this really tiny hamlet. There was only like four houses.、Oh. Yeah, so we had owls and foxes. It was just、oh. like really magical. It was just before I started to channel verbally, so it was just this really magical experience of living really closely with the land and the moon, and just coming from a town. And be living where there was no light pollution. <sighs> and how I could not believe a full moon just was—you didn't need lights, you know. We、mm. just never got dark on nights like that. So it really changed my experience of my relationship with nature. And I was working with Lilith energy at the time, the goddess Lilith,、mm-hmm. and that was very much about reclaiming. My own relationship to feminine energy and beginning of quite a feminist awakening in my life, and so I'd learned how to cast a circle the traditional way and work with the energies of a circle that the ancestors had laid down years upon years upon years upon years upon years, and to work with that collective energy. But Lilith came through and asked me to cast a circle in a very different way. So I really trust any guidance that I get from spirit over and above anything else.、Mm. And told my pagan friends, and one of them, the sea witch in particular, was just who was a man was just aghast <laughs> that I was going to break these rules and work in this way, and tried to talk me out of it. And the rest of them were like, "It's a bit strange. I wouldn't mess around with that."、Huh. And, I know, and I just thought that's really interesting. I don't feel that at all. So we went on one of our days to the stone circle, and it was oh my god! Honestly, it's something out of a book. You couldn't make it up. So mist fell.、Mm. We parked the cars by the side of the stone circle. You could not see your hands in front of your face. Wow! <laughs> so my friend was we. She cast the circle in the traditional way, and then she was doing magic work, circle work in within that circle that we'd cast. And then the guy who was not happy with what I was doing came to watch, <laughs>、yeah. um, but stood outside of the circle that I was going to cast. So I just followed my guidance from Lilith and closed my eyes and just saw all these women on the squad. It makes me cry now.、Mm. Just dressed in animals' clothing, 
like holding children just felt all these feminine ancestors who had worked really strongly and groundedly with earth energy real kind of gutsy Mm. kind of feel to it and just come and stand with me and so it cast I did what Lilith asked me to do and felt this energy ray rise from the earth within like this anger and rage and it moved through my body like I was a channel for it Mm. and so much so it was so strong I did think I think I might have bitten off more than I can chew because I thought I was going to pass out from it yeah but it just went straight up and I just did my thing and thought that's it and walked over to the rest of my friends and the guy that wasn't very happy with me just said look at what you've done and turned around and the floor just had these like dancing lights of energy wow and he said, i don't know what you've woke up there but i won't want to be in your shoes like really fear-based really huh yeah. and i was really respectful yeah like i was really respectful of the energies and trusting my own heart energy rather than my head mm. But he was like that. He was quite dominating and controlling kind of thing. But I just felt like that was the beginning of me being asked then afterwards, not by people that had known that I'd done the stone circle, but that led to me doing some land clearings Mm. and working with land with horses where there'd been a disease and cleared the land. And I think I was kind of energized Mm. with the ability to do that for a while. And then it kind of dropped off. So after that experience, all the rule books just went out and and I just found my own way. And now I just work with how I hear the circle asking and talking to me and wanting to work. Hmm. So for people who might not know what it means, what does it mean to cast a circle? Okay, so casting a circle for me means calling in the four quarters of the earth energy. So the earth, fire, well, yeah, earth, fire, water, air. So using the those elements, you invite them, you stand in each quarter mm-hmm. and each direction, should I say, yeah. and you invite the energies to work with you, the, the qualities of that quarter to work with you. I don't know if I'm making sense here because I just do it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty much how I describe it as well. So, for example, East is associated with air and mm-hmm. inspiration. When you're standing to cast a circle, like I've just done recently, you stand in the direction of the east and Mm. then you say an invitation to the ancestors and the spirits and the guardians of the east, of air, of Mm. inspiration to come with you and guide you and protect you. Mm -hmm. So calling in the quarters is one thing. Before you do that, you can walk around the perimeter Mm. of the stone circle and set the intention i use light language for this now but you set the intention to take it beyond space and time so traditionally Mm. when it wasn't perhaps safe to be a witch the idea is that the you cast a circle and that takes you beyond space and time so you are not seen you are Mm. held with suspended within a bubble outside of physical reality and i've had experiences where I've worked like that and a farmer's come on the moors when we're not supposed to really be there and they've not seen us. Mm. So that's the sense is that you initially take yourself beyond and outside time and space. I'm really glad you brought that up because I remember there was that time that you and I were at Avebury and we were at the circle at night and there were people around kind of coming out of the pub and we wanted to do work in the circle and you did that. And I really felt like we were not in a different dimension, maybe, I don't know, but like, I felt like we were in this really protective space. And then the second you broke it, it was like we were back. I don't know. I really felt a big difference between once you had kind of cast the circle in that way and then when you uncast it. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for mentioning that. And I think I have a sense of like entitlement when it comes to working with that. I don't know why, but it's just like, that's my space. I'm taking it up. Mm. Um, And I think when you do start working with earth energies and stone circles, you you kind of feel like that. You know, Mm. you kind of feel like it's there just for you. It's a Mm. really special connection. And you mentioned land clearing. So what does that mean to do a land clearing? Well, the first time I was asked to do it, I just thought, I have no idea what that means. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And so basically, 
it's just like healing the land as you would heal an aur- aur- auric field. So if anybody practices Reiki, you mm-hmm. know that you just send the energy. Well, you don't. You open and allow yourself to mm-hmm. be a channel for that energy to be pulled through by the participant. But also, if you notice any blocks or anything stuck in the auric field of a person, you work with that and you work to clear that, shift it, move it, bring light to it. It's exactly the same principle with the land. So Mm -hmm. I work with the energies of the land. So I can see or feel into where blocks are that we call disease or whatever. And I just work with it in that way, just very similar to doing Reiki. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you also mentioned that you started to work with light language in the stone circle. So what is that and how do you use light language with the, with the circles? Okay, so you'll remember. My, yeah. I did not choose light language to enter into my experience. That was just like a bit of a step too far for me, but I'll be ever <laughs> grateful for you. <laughs> if you go to Avery with Holly, watch out. When we went to Avery and I just felt this urging to work with it was the smaller stone circle, wasn't it? You know, that yeah. More, yeah. And to cast a circle and just to see kind of what happened and then felt this huge urge to start channeling what felt like tones and light mm. and to speak it. And so I'm like, oh, no, there's really crazy things happening, Holly. Like, bring it on, bring it on. <laughs> I think I have that effect on people. <laughs> It's kind of like the way that stone, light language works for me is it's like a um, hmm. 3D form of communication. So I hear it as melody. I see it as symbols and feel it as movement too. Hmm. So light language is, if I'm really honest, I don't understand what it is. I just hmm. do it. So I think hmm. there's people that are better informed than I am about the history of it and what they think it is. But for me, it's just like part of the original language. It's hmm. it's how we communicate um, beyond when we're not in the physical reality. So for me, I only, I used to use it in healings. And so basically I it's like speaking a different language Mm. and so I played with it when it first started happening and in case I was making it up (laughs) and it's the same sounds and tones that come through it's a very particular frequency but my personal opinion and the way that I use it is light language is the way to bring us back to ourselves so I quite often sing light language to myself when I'm in the bath (laughs) and it helps me really just pull my own energy back into my center, call back my power. Because I remember the first time I tried, I did it. Afterwards, I went to the local co-op. I went to the local shop. So I walked into that shop. I could feel that if I'd have not done the light language, there's all these like smaller parts of me that people pleasing, approval seeking, that were ready to leap into action and go and do all that kind of interaction socially. Hmm. But because I'd worked with the light language and I was really centered on myself, I wasn't sending any of my energy out there. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Really centered and focused. And when I've talked to other people about light language, that's their sense as well. So it's like, it's a language of your own soul. Oh, I like that's that. Like to me, yeah. I've been so drawn to light language for so long. I did a couple of years ago a sound healing sessions with this woman and she worked with light language with me, and I just absolutely love it. It's like I feel so drawn to it, and I've never been able to do it. <laughs> so it's it's something that I just, it's, I don't know, maybe in the future, I don't know, but it's, uh, it's something I'm fi- really called to experience. I experienced a friend of mine who worked with cacao energy and the goddess and went over to train in it and, and all sorts, really embodied in it, and she did cacao ceremonies. And she started to channel the language of the cow, and mm-hmm. that came through light language. Light language. Mm-hmm. So she would, we'd all do the ceremony, and we'd have a drink of it, and then, I mean, how it's really activating, and yeah. then we'd all sit down, and she'd come and speak to us in this language, just like let it flow over our bodies, and it's communication beyond words. So mm-hmm. it was, yeah, it was gorgeous. Mm, I like that. So do the stone circles talk with you? Do they communicate with you in any way? They do now, not yeah. always. <laughs> so when I first moved down here, I got in, um, introduced to Boz Karanun, which is probably the most famous one where I live. And it's the it's considered to be the most powerful. Ooh. But then there's one that's about 
about a mile and a half from me. Mm-hmm. And I it was after Avebury, I think. I think it was about the first time I went to Avebury with you around that time. I started feeling connected more to the land because I'd been running the trails a lot more and getting lost and Mm. (laughs) so felt really connected and then one night as I was going to bed I heard Trekker Seal the local stone circle talk to me and say come and work with me and I just thought okay (laughs) Cora (laughs) (laughs) I think this might be a step too far darling (laughs) Uh, so Kind of my normal thing is, am I going insane? And then I have to push that to one side and just follow what happens. And so I went to talk to the stone circle and basically the message I got for all, it's like all the stone circles want to be used. Like mm. this one a tour, was a tourist attraction. It's people come and see it, people come and look at it, but it wasn't getting used. That's mm. my sense of it. And so light language with it and just followed what it wanted me to do. And like kind of, wanted activating again and that's when I found out that according to legend when I don't know my timelines in history but when the Romans were coming over Mm. and when Christianity was getting a stronghold over here Merlin went around and closed all the stone circles and so those of us that are magical that have got magic in them can help to re-engage them, reactivate them, get them talking to each other. Like this one, Trigger Seal, is definitely connected to Avery because I've received information from Trigger Seal about Avery and then done research and found out it's true. So it's like for me, they all talk to each other. And I think they are my portals to all the dimensions. They are portals to the earth grid, to all of it. They're like slipstreams to each other. I love that concept. Mm. So when you say they want to be used, how do they want to be used? They want to be activated, they want to be used for ceremony, what do they want? That was my sense, is to be used for ceremony, but the most important thing, so one of the direct experiences I've had, so I trust direct experience over everything when it comes to working with spirit. And so I was out there meditating on a particular issue I had going on in my life and just asking for guidance and support and help and had these healing experiences, but then heard the stone circle tell me to lay down. And I was in a place where I wanted to give so much to the stone circle. When the stone circle was talking to me about activating me, my tendency was to Think, how can I help the stone circle? How can I give energy to it? What can I do to support it? When actually, the way that it wants to be used is to support human beings. So my direct experience when I laid down is I see the energy grid of a stone circle and the energy grid started to work with my energy, my auric field. And then it hooked my auric field up to that of the earth. Mm -hmm. And... I think that's part of our reconnecting with Earth and part of our issues around the environmental stuff that's so important right now is we need to reconnect energetically with the Earth too. Mm, yeah. And to know that we're wanted here, by, like the Earth wants us. I think some of the environmental stuff that's going on now, we just have this perpetual guilt about living on this planet because of all the so-called, you know, the damage that we've yeah. done. We just feel like parasitic and we're not. We're deeply loved, deeply wanted. Hmm. If we behave properly. (laughs) Well, I think if you ever feel guilty about anything, that is just a block. You're never going to... If you feel guilty about being on this planet, who is going to want to move towards that guilt Hmm. in order to get beyond it and then think, what? how do I feel connected here? So it's like if you're parenting, you can parent through guilt and manipulation if you want to. (laughs) but. It's not very conducive and it's certainly not like there's no loving solution in that. Mm. So I think if we knew that we were dearly loved and wanted by the earth, that's a starting point. And Mm. also, I think the other part of it is our consciousness contributes to what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Environmentally, too. So to go back, I think I've wandered off the point. here. That's okay. It's all good. (laughs) To go back to your point about how they want to be activated, I think they want to help us. Mm. So how can people build a personal relationship with a stone circle or multiple stone circles? I'm lucky because it's on my doorstep. I know. Um, 
which I think is part of why I felt so moved to come down here like, unconsciously. But you don't have to live near one. You could visit one energetically too, yeah. I think. You know, you can do circle work in your own living room. So I think if you haven't got access to a stone circle, I would just start thinking about how you can start building a connection to circle work mm-hmm. and to bring the elements and the connection to earth into wherever you're living now. You can do that in your living room or your bedroom, can't you? Mm, yes. If you have got one that you can visit, then this might sound mad, but just start talking to it. Mm. And I mean, it happened organically for me, but it was after years of visiting them and yeah. with them and deeply respecting and honouring what I thought that they meant and what they were doing. And when I first started working with stone circles, I didn't feel like that. I mm. just I felt like they were just pretty things. Yeah. So take it seriously. And then trust your impulses and intuitions. So, for example, um, last week I was out walking with a friend and we were talking about we go to our stone circle quite regularly to do work and just to get energised there. And I was talking about just what's next on my personal growth. And I just kept seeing a flash of Boscowan on in my head, this stone circle. And I've not been there for ages. I used to run there and back. Mm. It's like five miles each way. Um, and I just thought, oh, I need to go there because I kept seeing the picture. So I trust mm. that and I need to go there. And then as I was feeling into what day was right to do, I just said, let's do Sunday. It just feels right. And then afterwards, somebody told me it was Lionsgate on yep. Sunday. I didn't know because I always forget dates. Me but too. the energy had already started landing and I could feel it. So we went and did a ceremony. And it was lovely because there was about three other groups that came and went. So there was lots of drumming and talking to people and people had left offerings and all sorts of stuff so it was really a communal experience but it was just the flash of the stone circle and I just thought oh it wants me to mm. go back. So you mentioned that they want to help us and they don't necessarily want anything from us but what can we give back to the circles to show our gratitude? So I think what I was saying about taking them seriously yeah. is like they want to be used and not seen as just pretty. Yeah. I, that that like respect yeah. of what has gone on before helps you tap into those energies. So quite often I see ancestors, a group of ancestors will come with a message. On my birthday, some ancestors turned up in the West Quarter and I got a message about money. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's really practical stuff. Yeah. You know? it's, not, it's not just a, you can do it as a lovely, nice anchoring thing to do, you know, mm. grounding practice. Or when you start developing a relationship with the circles and you get to know them, then you can access a lot of guidance, information. I've had lots of healing experiences. Yeah. Hmm. So why do you think people feel drawn or called to visit stone circles? I think it's an unconscious knowing and desire to reconnect to Hmm. our ancestral way of being, our more intuitive way of living in the world a more embodied way of living in the world, a disconnect from our addictive society, you know, Mm. in the material world. I love some of the material world, but if that's all that you experience, you feel this huge disconnection from yourself and the earth. So, Mm. but I think it's a connection to our own magic as well and our interconnectedness with earth energies. Mm. So what else can people get from visiting a stone circle like why might they want to go visit one well that's enough isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like this might be really kind of abstract for some people who aren't used to working with energies in this way so I'm just wondering okay. like like even if you're not tapped into the magic and the energy and well what do you think what do you think because I think I go so far into that place yeah. of the energy and the reading the energy that yeah. it won't occur to me anything else so yeah yeah. See, it's hard for me to describe. I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, there were times when I was visiting Avebury twice a month, every month for months. Mm-hmm. You know, I go there a lot, or I used to go there a lot. And I just felt this call to the land. I felt this like urge to visit on a regular basis, but I never understood it. Like, I don't have that kind of I don't know. It's very abstract to me. Like, I don't, I don't talk to it. I haven't heard it. It hasn't spoken to me. Like, I don't have that kind of same relationship with you. So it was like, I just kept feeling called to go there, not understanding why, walking the land, and not... Wasn't that the introduction to your kind of druid pathway and 
like that's what that relationship was about for mm-hmm. me when I think of you was it you yeah I think so absolutely and I think also when I was visiting Avebury like on a fortnightly basis that was when I was at the height of working on my tree project and for my tree book and I think there's something about the energy of the land there that I needed to absorb or experience in order to get that project out into the world. I think that my belief is that your relationship with Avery is part of opening you up as a channel. Yeah, it might be. And they're just like, it's the same place to go. And it's just like, you know, I said it's the, the like my church. So I think yeah. people are like that is just like a bit of a sanctuary. Hmm. So it can be a way to unplug from the absolute mania. I do this so regularly. So as a matter of fact, I think I forget the importance of it. Sometimes I just go to the stone circle and lay down on the land hmm. and just unplug. And that's what it means to me. But it's just it's a way to decompress. It's hmm. a way to just unplug. Yeah. Just I think it's important for me to say to people, like, if you go to a stone circle and, like, you don't see, like, magic and ancestors and, like, lights and all the amazing stuff that you experience, like, you're still getting something from the experience. Because I don't see any of that stuff, but Mm -hmm. I know that something is happening that I can't see, that I don't understand. Like, I'm not just going there and going, oh, what a pretty place. I really like it here. Like, there's something happening that I don't understand and I can't explain, but it's really important. I absolutely see you having a magical relationship with stone circles and Mm. you just work in a state of knowingness, which is magic. It's just a different form. I can't remember the actual name for it. Is it claircognizance when you just know? I can't remember. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, claircognizance. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how you experience through a deep knowing. Mm. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I don't know. So on a practical level, like, you know, me and... Me and a friend want to do some EFT and site K work mm. on our relationship with money. And she's a single parent. And so am I. We've got teenagers in our houses. My house is like um, an old tin miner's cottage. So it's not massive. So we're just like, where are we going to do this work? Where we're not going to get stuck? <laughs> we'll go to the Stone Circle. So we're just going to do EFT. I'll probably cast a circle so that people might not come into it. Yeah. Um, but we're just going to take take ourselves and just from a place to just go because we haven't got room in our house. We're going to go <laughs> FT there, you know? So I like that because it's a really practical thing. Mm, mm-hmm. And whenever, you know, we quite often feel the desire to go on a full moon. And when I go with my friend, we'll put Spotify on because there's a really good connection on the moors. It's better than in my own house. <laughs> And we'll dance, we'll just move our bodies, we'll just die, de-stress and laugh and giggle and talk. And I think that was, you know, like that's my church. I go yeah. with my friends and just hang. Mm. So, yeah. and, and just laugh and swear and, you know, all sorts of <laughs> practical stuff. So someone who's new to visiting Stone Circles, what what other kinds of things can they do when they go there? So if you're brand new... I would encourage you to just see that you have got a right to a personal relationship. Like Mm. act as though that stone circle is there for you Mm. and touch the stones, get to know them. Mm. I was taught to ask permission to enter the stone circle before you do go Mm. in. Were you taught that? Um, I have read that. I don't always do it. Uh But yeah, I, I, I know that's a thing. Yeah, so I would just use it as a plate, like put your hand on the stone circle before you're going in, just take pause, mm. just so that you're not necessarily asking permission, just so that you're recognising you're stepping over into something yeah. different. And I don't I don't know what else to say, to be honest, Holly. And it's just like go and visit as many yeah. stone circles as you can and yeah. just start to build up a relationship with them. It depends what you want to get out of it. Yeah. I mean, you, it can be as simple as you just go there and you walk around the stone circle and you walk around the land. That's what I have done for so many years with Avebury. And, and I know that I'm getting something out of it that I don't understand, but I'm just, you know, walking around, hanging out, sitting down, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, ours are linked up on the moors. And so the moors are sacred places as well. You know, there's things that happen as you walk. So oh. as you walk through the moors and that's really magical. Um, oh, tell me more. 
Well, I just, I, it's, oh, Cornish traditional folklore is just amazing for stories of devils and Ooh. fae, fairy energy that's mm. mischievous. And I've certainly experienced that in some of the bogs and everything. So with the moors, it's the, a lot of it is, there's the ley lines and pilgrimages that have gone before. But with, yeah, with the moors, I would just walk around them and just collect what I needed to know along the way I don't work with them purposely that is mm. just a walking experience but yeah I don't know what else to say about that really mm. so is there any advantage to visiting some of the smaller lesser known stone circles rather than going to the more popular ones mm, the more popular ones I was thinking about this and I was thinking about in terms of you know, Reiki symbols, mm -hmm. like the way that they work is because a lot of people have sat and meditated on those symbols. Mm -hmm. Like the the monks, when, it, when they were first using them, used to sit and focus their intention on the meaning of the symbol. And so it's like all this energy has been projected onto those symbols. That's what I think makes them really powerful. Mm -hmm. So when we use Reiki symbols, we tap into all that yeah. projected intention and focus and so I think that's the same with stone circles mm. so some of the bigger ones have probably had a lot more energy yeah projected onto them and focused on them so if you are going to experience anything it's probably the bigger ones that might make it easier mm -hmm. because of that focus of intent but the smaller ones are just just as powerful mm. I don't think it makes any any difference other than maybe the focus of intention I think big and small might be just because of our like yeah you know, yeah cultural way of looking at something big is better and all that kind of stuff it's not true yeah I was also thinking that the smaller ones are probably going to have fewer people visiting so you're more likely to be on your own especially if you go during the week um and perhaps you might have more privacy Mm, and I've thought about that yeah that's yeah. a really practical point of view yeah I mean whenever I go to Avebury I try not to do it on a weekend I try to do it during the week and through the winter like when there are very few people visiting and and those are the times that I enjoy it the most because there aren't as many people around mm, yeah yeah that's a really good point I suppose I'm spoiled because of the yeah. down here there's not many people I around am. I do get frustrated like um, <laughs> <laughs> My <story's coming> down. <laughs> I, know. I know what you mean and and especially I wanted to say about Stonehenge um the first time I visited it I didn't feel anything energetically mm -hmm. and I thought oh you know it's really nice I'm glad I visited it but I don't feel anything going on here and it wasn't until the first time I visited it with my druid group it was just us 100 people sunrise in the summer for a private ceremony, and we were allowed to go among the stones, whereas when you go as a tourist during the day, you're not allowed to get near the stones. That was the first time I felt like, oh, there's definitely something here. <laughs> and I hadn't, I hadn't experienced that when I visited as a tourist. Do you think as well that is like the the um, the the power of ritual and yeah. what it helps you tap into? Yeah, yeah. I, I think absolutely, absolutely. But I think so many people go to Stonehenge and they're really disappointed by it. I've heard that from so many people, and I think mm -hmm. perhaps that's just because of the way that you know they're allowed to engage with it as a tourist. You know, you don't get to go among the stones, and you don't you're not having a ceremony. You're just kind of visiting it as if it were like a museum. And I think that's yeah. a very different way of engaging with it. Yes, and I suppose that's the point that I was trying to make in that the stone circles were saying we want to be used. So mm. when you do ritual or you think about them in terms of ritual and ceremony, it helps you tap into something else, another direct experience of them. Yep. So your intention is really important. Yeah. And I think that's the only difference that, that why I have the experiences that I have is that's my intention because that's how I was taught years ago. Yeah. That my intention is always to tap into the energies, the rituals, what's really there. So when we, the first time I went to Avery, we just called it that on the way to, you know, when I went over to John of God, mm -hmm. on the way to the airport, we called in at Avery, made sense. And that's the first time I'd been, I'd not read anything about it. And I remember thinking, oh, it's a stone circle. It'll turn me into earth energies. It'll be really grounding. This would be brilliant, really grounding before I go to John of God. Mm -hmm. 
And so when we got there, I walked into the stone circle and just went, whoa, and looked up and I just went, okay, it's not an earth energy one, this then, it's a (laughs) star seed energy, this is galactic, looking up at the sky. And then I thought, oh God, of course it is, it's like surrounded by crop circles, (laughs) it's completely grounding. But I'm really glad I never thought about it too much before I went because it was the energies of the land Mm -hmm. and the circle that were telling me what its purpose was and what it's been used for rather than me reading about it in history books and imposing my own understanding on the land. Yeah, yeah. You were getting the information from your experience rather than from other people's sources. Yeah. 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 And that is because it was just, just the intention of being open to whatever the land wanted to tell me. And Mm. I think that's the bit that I was trying to get across with the environmental stuff as well. It's like, land has got things to tell us to remind of us of yeah. who we really are mm. um whatever that might mean to you it's very empowering yeah absolutely and experiences of what that state of empowerment they need next mm. oh i love it love it yeah. so where can people find stone circles in their area and other ancient sites do you where do you go to find new stone circles or do you just visit the ones that you know well, Google's always my friend. Yeah. <laughs> by Google, so I would Google whatever land, you know, wherever I was staying. And that's how I, yeah, I, I did. I just Googled down mm-hmm. here. And then there's some local books written about Cornwall. And I think you're going to put a link to some websites as well about yeah. where you can find out. But I, yeah, just google yeah that's good yeah the website that i use is called the megalithic portal it's megalithic.co.uk and i'll link to that in the show notes but i have found so many sites on this website it's basically like linked into not google maps but another map system but you can go to wherever you are wherever you're going and zoom in and see all of the sacred wells and stone circles and ancient sites and like it's it's so good. Basically, it's got so much information on it. And then it gives you information on how well preserved the site is and how easily you can access it and that kind of thing. So that that has been my source for finding stuff that I didn't know was in my area. Yeah, and then local guides. So I was looking when I moved down here that there was um, a pagan hippie guy that introduced me to everything. Like mm. we've got um, lots of sacred stones and so and all my friends told me about the um, kind of little known and little advertised places up at at, um, Bodmin and Cornwall. So there's two ways to do this. I think if you want to get to know them, set the intention and ask the universe source energy, all that is, your guides, whatever way you, you work, if you work that way, to bring people into your life that can help you make a connection in this way. That's what I did. I asked for my soul family. Hmm. But also checking your local area if there are any tour guides so down here there's lots of walks and tour guides and people oh. run all sorts of yeah there's lots of local people that do guided walks guided tours of the sacred places and they will give you the history and also like the you no know, little known history and the stories that get passed on so i would mm. check out to see if there's anything like that in your local area because it be the grassroots people that know the most Mm, I like that yeah I'd never thought about that Mm, yeah they're just advertised quite a lot it's quite you know part of the tourist industry yeah yeah Yeah. Hmm. so is there anything else you'd like to add about stone circles and your experience and how people can engage with them any last words if you are sat here thinking that's not what I do, I'm, you know, I don't like nature. That one, well, no, they won't be listening to your podcast if they didn't like nature. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose people who are listening to your podcast might be thinking I'm not spiritual mm. or I don't experience the energies of them. I would just be, encourage them to just be open and mm. they are. Yeah. <laughs> they are. Yeah. 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 That's it, really, I think, yeah. Yeah, I would say if you've got access to stone circles, I mean, Avebury, like I I visit it a lot, but it's an hour and 45 minutes from my house. It's not like it's right next door. If you feel, if you have stone circles anywhere in your area, I would say just visit one and just be open and curious and just see what happens. I mean, worst case scenario, you see something new. It's a pretty place. 
best case scenario, something else might happen. <laughs> yeah, they're in stunning places. So my one of you know my favourite on Bodmin Moors, Stannan, is about an hour away from me, and it is in the most beautiful spot. You know, so that's the worst that can happen is you experience some lovely time in nature, really. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So, Cara, where can people find you online and learn more about what you do? The main place that people can find me is my website, which is carawild.com. I'm also on Instagram. I share a lot of um, stone circle pictures on there, yes. and that's at wildcara. Um, yeah, they're the two main places where you can find out about me and what I do. Yeah, sounds perfect. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so glad we finally had this conversation because I, I love hearing about all of your adventures at Stone Circles and it's just, uh, I love it. Oh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks. That's it for now. Please drop me a line and let me know what you thought about this week's episode. You can email me at holly at hollywarton.com or find me online and get in touch there. Remember to visit hollywarton.com forward slash 421 for the show notes on this episode. And in the meantime, happy trails to you. Thanks so much for listening to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. You can find more information about today's episode, including links for topics that were discussed at hollywarton.com. That's H-O-L-L-Y-W-O-R-T-O-N.com. If you'd like to connect with other listeners and get support on your journey, I would love for you to join my private community on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Holly Wharton. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Holly Wharton. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to seeing you next week.